All right, this is Brent Leary, and I am uh, once again at the top of the Atlanta Tech Village here in Buckhead. It's so cool to be at the top, and the sun is coming out. Oh, yeah. We get a nice little view in the background, and once again, I'm, I'm here with my buddy Anand Tucker. Uh, he was with me uh, about five or six months ago uh, when you were talking about the MarTech landscape, oh, yeah. and at the time, uh, there was about a little over 5,300 or 5,501. Um, but that was last year. You're here to talk about this year, so thanks again for joining me. Absolutely, this is a long time coming, so. <laughs> well, I know you spend a long time putting this stuff together, so I think you just recently uh, did the 2018. That's right, that's right. It was uh, just a month, a little over a month ago, and uh, we, yeah, to give you a sense of the process, right, uh, just a quick background, like, I, you know, Scott's been a wonderful, Scott, guy, Brinker. Like Scott Brinker, right, he's been a wonderful uh, leader, godfather of the industry, right, and, uh, you know, my, my desire to help him was to help him because he's done so much for this industry. I've benefited tremendously personally, professionally in this industry as many people, you know, in our space has. Um, so how could we kind of get him off the slide was one of the things that we really wanted to kind of, you know, move toward. And since we're both data-driven folks, we, that was a really great opportunity for us to make that work. And uh, what ended up happening was uh, this time around, last year, we started doing a little more data-driven analysis. Uh, and then this past year, we had, I've got automated uh, scripts, algorithms, scrapings, you know, news <laughs> clippers, like all kinds of stuff, harvesting you know, information as from press releases, from various data sources uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, and then of course, like for the last seven months uh, prior to the uh, the actual conference or the release of the uh, of the landscape, uh, it was an intense like scraping, you know, scrubbing through that information, you know, selecting which companies were in, which ones made sense to do so, and of course also recognizing what are the trends in the you know in Martech that we needed to capture, um, and which ones are not that are in the landscape that we needed to remove. Um, wow. So there were some interesting notions on that. Uh, we started off with 37,000 companies that got harvested. So, you know, just because you have the data doesn't mean you really, really have the, you know, have wow. the knowledge or the intel. So you really do have to work at it. We did that. Um, and the, the final tally this year was uh, 6,829. So we went down that path. Uh, a couple of themes that came out of it, one, or several themes that came out of it. Uh, one was certainly landscapes growing. Right, and we were trying to explain clearly. There's always this predictions of consolidation every year, and clearly that's not happening. The growth certainly has slowed in terms of the number. Last year was 40 percent, close to 40. This year is, you know, right around floating around 30 percent. Uh, still significant growth. The churn was about the same as last year. Uh, you know, more enterprise players were getting into the space. Uh, so every one of those is a tremendous footprint and you know noisemaker in the space. Uh, we also started to kind of recognize, we know the trends about AI, we talked about that the last time we right. sat down and chatted. You know, we were debating should AI, predictive analytics, predictive actually was already in the landscape as a subcategory, uh, we removed it. Uh, you know, I decided that it didn't make sense because you're doing predictive analytics on what, right? So predictive okay. analytics just isn't done on the silo in the corner. I work with a lot of companies who are trying to become more data enabled in their, not only their jobs, but the way that leaderships and executives are trying to make bigger decisions. And a lot of the mistakes that companies are making is, we'll just outsource this to some data you know, science company, or we'll, wow. you know, we'll hire a bunch of data scientists and put them in a corner and make that happen. And that doesn't work that way. You really have to embed that into your day-to-day, -day, uh, into the operations of your organization, the strategy sessions of your organization and how you move forward. So we removed predictive analytics. And it was interesting to see that all those companies that were in that cap, 70 plus companies, were already somewhere else in the landscape anyway, right? And so that was, uh, that was, you know, that was really gratifying to be able to pull that out. Uh, but for the same exact reasons, we decided. Just hold on yeah, a second. Yeah, that was a little loud. Like, yeah, that was <laughs> yeah, real loud. I, I mean, I could talk over enough, but that was something. That, so I'll, I'll kind of go back to maybe something that I was talking about. Yeah. Let's see. Once they get past. Uh, all right, I think we're good. That's good. That's good. All right. Um, 
So we removed predictive analytics altogether and we found that the 70%, 70 plus companies that were in there were already found in other parts of the landscape uh, being applied in some specific need or problem that marketers were being solved. Uh, same reason, we didn't include AI as a category either. That was a lot of questions we got and a lot of complaints that, you know, how come you don't have AI in there? Well, you don't just use AI for the sake of using AI, it's being applied. It's a foundational piece. It's, it's, point, a, it's a capability, yeah. it's a feature. It is, it, maybe it's a major part of it, right. but it's not something you necessarily need to call out right. uh, if it, because it is needs to be applied elsewhere. It's like back in the days when social was totally separate from CRM and we started saying, well, social CRM, they, they kind of work together. And then a couple of years later when every vendor that had any kind of uh, right. you know capabilities had social baked in. You don't hear anybody saying social right. CRM anymore. So right. yeah, AI is yeah, and, and and it's a challenge, right? I, I applaud Scott for even putting those categories together. That yeah. I'm getting a privilege of you know helping him manipulate, right? But. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Another thing that came up too, of course, with all the privacy matters that have been coming around, uh, we have a new category on uh, you know, privacy, data governance, uh, that was included, and a handful of companies that are, you know, have, or two dozen companies that are you know, immersed in there. Um, that was a, certainly a new thing. Um, and then we evolved one category from just simply chat and surveys or feedback to now the feedback category has moved all of it into customer experience because that's really a core component of customer experience, customer success. Uh, and then the chat component, we uh, expanded into live chat, and um, excuse me, chat bots and live chat. So this conversational, like what I see, which is gonna be intriguing is, um, the, the, the real-time nature of that conversation is going to give us both an interesting, deep, qualitative and quantitative aspect and understanding of our customers now. Yeah. Um, and that's going to be a new flavor of, of, of information we never had before. And it's now including sort of the aspect of time into the mix, right? At that time, you know, this customer from Amazon was really upset and they got onto chat and all of a sudden they gave a five star rating at the end of the, or a happy face, you know, at the end of that chat session, right? Did that, that's an interesting measure of success. And then not only at that point, but now collectively, are we seeing how that impacts the brand yeah. overall as a result of it? So those were some, some really interesting components. But, um, you know, one thing that I was reading about was, if knowledge and technology becomes a commodity, right? We, we, I always talk about that technology magnifies, you know, the processes, the people, and data behind it. Right. Um, so if that's all pretty much, you know, AI takes care of the knowledge piece, and you know, some, what really is going to be the next differentiator? And it's going to be trust, right? And it's an easy one to say, but it's hard to understand, like, really internalize and invest in unless yeah. you've already built up that good advocacy brand or you built up a good customer base and community is uh, you know sort of the word of the year for me is like building strong communities are showing real strong returns on investment companies like HubSpot for instance you know they quadrupled since they <laughs> IPO'd in terms of their share price um, at Lassian when they went IPO no matter how much like they get beat down because of the um, because of the economic you know, uh, measures, they come up like even stronger than before and they have a strong developer community. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, I don't know if we talked about this before, but Microsoft moving from uh, sort of a, you know, sort of an ego centric view of the world, uh, you know, not to, I mean, that's what it needed at the time. And right. I'm not being too critical about that right. to a more empathetic view of the world, like being, you know, we want to be part of the community. We want to be uh, partners and friends and frenemies more so than, yeah. you know, trying to own everything everywhere and uh, at, at no cost, you know, at every cost possible. Well, it's funny you mentioned, you actually mentioned trust and empathy and, and of course, the AI aspects, the insight. I, I literally use a slide in my presentations for the last four or five years where I kind of walk, walk through how data turns into trust and the insights and empathy in the middle are the real connectors mm -hmm. between, at mm -hmm. least that's my opinion. So it's really cool to hear you say that because I think we're all thinking along the same lines. Empathy leads to trust. Right. If you can get the empathy right, because a lot of times you can have the data right, you can find the right insight, but if you deliver it in a way that is negatively received, then all that great work you did under get mm -hmm. aggregating the data, finding the right insight, that doesn't do you any good because right. you don't use empathy to deliver it in such a way that it's going to be well received and create the trust. Right. right. So it's good to hear. It's 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 actually you know it's actually 
people, customers and consumers are much smarter than companies give them credit for, right? Yeah. They can call out and they can see the lack of empathy or perhaps even the authentic, lack of authenticity when lack you're talking about interest, really. or, or sometimes lack of interest, right? <laughs> I mean, reading from a script is not the right no. training to be had, right? Uh, there's that's, that's part of the reason why we talk about hiring is so important, you know, but again, we haven't actually talked about training. I know HR is going to start going through its disruption, but training is going to be critical in shaping your employees because they are the front runners of the brand. Um, the other thing that came out, the biggest other piece that came out of the uh, landscape or the MarTech uh, conference that we found was um, this cross collaboration of, of the organization, right? So if we see that consumers are demanding more on an iterative basis, companies are having to keep pace to be, um, you know, to, to stay differentiated, but also to stay relevant. Um, in order to do that, more companies, enterprise or small business, are breaking down the silos between, we always talk about breaking down silos between departments. Uh, you know, in the MarTech landscape, I, we, we have sales as a category, we have customer success as a category, because while all of those functions may have departments assigned to them, they and they all have respective customer touch points, being able to understand how to connect that journey, which clearly has been very disconnected for a great deal of time, connecting that across the board, marketing still seems to be or will be very responsible or have visibility in the experiential part of that across the board. If something goes wrong in legal, guess what? Marketing is going to be the one to have to handle that, right? right. Uh, with privacy, guess what? We got legal and marketing now having to work together. Operations and marketing to work together. Finance and marketing work together. So it's beyond our traditional you know, trifecta that we've been talking about yeah. um, with sales, marketing, and customer success. But, you know, Brent, I mean, how have you seen like a lot of this empathy translate into organizations changing or having to change uh, to, to meet that demand or perhaps become more connected with the consumers that they've I may have lost. You're like turning with. the tables on me here, man. <laughs> That's how I like it, right? This is, this is dialogue, right? Well, you know as much as you know more than I do, my friend. Well, but I think the thing that uh, we we hear a lot of digital about digital disruption and digital transformation and kind of the things that move, make things move. Customer adoption is the most disruptive mm. uh, thing out there, and it's the thing that should be at the center of your digital transformation mm. because, mm -hmm. as you said customers are smarter than they ever have been. They have more tools at their disposal. They're demanding that you not only value them for their money, but they value, you value them for their smarts Absolutely. and their you know, behavioral and the way that they can drive things and their, their expectations. They, they want you to value their expectations going forward. <laughs> so I think um, all of that is, is playing a role in all the developments, you know, also what's going on with your MarTech landscape and all the companies that are that are stepping up, that are trying to answer pieces to the puzzle. But one of the more interesting things that just happened <clears throat> earlier this week, one of the biggest MarTech companies, of course, is Adobe. Right. Uh, and what they did uh, with their $1.5 billion announced acquisition of uh, Magento is basically now they're saying, you know, commerce and MarTech have to be closer together. And it, this didn't start with them. This is kind of their answer because Salesforce bought Demandware, they right. bought Cloud Craze, SAP bought Hybris, and even well before that, Oracle bought ATG. Mm -hmm. So they all, all these companies that have their marketing clouds also have commerce clouds. You're seeing the, the integration of these things. And so with Adobe buying Magento, it, it solidifies it even more. But as a MarTech expert, what do you see the importance of this this announcement and what does that do to the MarTech landscape overall? Yeah, I think this is just another ad for Adobe who actually, in my opinion, has been intelligently putting a lot of these things together, yeah. very silently so. I mean, yes, there's your traditional press releases, but I have a feeling they're gonna pop this rabbit out of their hat that's gonna be <laughs> incredible. I mean, I, I know, uh, you know, I've certainly been a fan of Adobe for a long time. Uh, you know, they've certainly done a tremendous job transitioning into cloud-based wear. Um, you know, anybody who, and, they, and they've taken their time to do it. Um, uh, and they've built, again, a strong community of advocates behind them for a long time. And they're, they're going with them. They're staying with them across the board. Uh, and we're talking about value or, you know, at another conversation of ours, you know, they're, they're adding value of why you would want to need to stick to the Adobe brand. This Magento acquisition, uh, you know, it's the de facto 
uh, angle for people to be able to set up e-commerce as you grow out of your, say, marketplace version of your store. So we're trying to meet the needs of going longer tail into the small business as well, since we're talking about um, you know, how much of this uh, new economy is going to be more gig economy to something greater. Uh, these, they want to stay ahead of that, and I think that's one aspect of it. I think all the other companies find that e-commerce and MarTech or customer data and uh, e-commerce are extremely powerful together. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, you know, we certainly talked about this. Uh, feel free to cut this piece out if you need to cut this piece out. But um, you know, it was over at a SAP conference. Uh, you know, talk. And they actually talk about GDPR and how that could be beneficial to marketers. And at the same time, uh, it was really between uh, you know some of the interesting work they have with Gigya and uh, Hybris yeah. and how do you put those together, right? Now, if you've developed a stronger relationship with uh, your customers with uh, you know with a Gigya platform, for example, how to and then you've got a Hybris you know exacting on the transactions. How can you intelligently put those together to be able to be a better have a better conversation, yeah. uh, you know, with your customers on an ongoing basis. Well, I think you know it, the other companies have already kind of done that with you know Demandware and now the Commerce Cloud with S with Salesforce and SAP with Hybris and Oracle. Um, Adobe needed this. Uh, they had every other pieces of the component uh, of the puzzle there. You know, they their their marketing you know tools mm -hmm. for marketers are. You know the creative cloud stuff is, is great. The, the marketing cloud now, this experience cloud, a lot of components. And you, I think they've been the smartest in terms of acquisitions. Their acquisition strategy to me has been really good. Going back to Omniture mm -hmm. and then oh, yeah. you know all the things they bought since then. And I think this, this is with Magento. They did. There weren't a whole lot of pieces left big players left. Right, there was. So, That's I true. mean, when you think of it, Shopify and Magento are probably the two most <laughs> notable ones still around. Right. So I think it was it was smart, but they had to do it because now they got the closed loop. So you, you, they have the marketing tools to help creatives create the marketing content. They have the tools that help you with like experience manager to, to kind of manage the assets and analyze the assets. But they didn't have the piece that once the people have found the collateral and started interacting with the collateral and engaged through the process, now they have it where they can get the transaction online. Before right. they didn't have that piece. Now they do. It'll be really interesting to see how they put it all together and what kind of closed loop it really looks like and how it compares to the Commerce Cloud and the, the Market Cloud that Salesforce has and, right. and the other ones. Um, but the bottom line is, I think MarTech you know, just the big scheme of things has, has become so critical to the overall health of the organization because of the digital aspects of the digital transformation. This was a no-brainer for them. They had to do it. I think so. I think so. I think it's one of those aspects of commerce. I mean, there's more, a lot money in commerce. I mean, I know I play a little more on the B2B space, merging into the commerce space, a lot our consumer and customer space. And it, I mean, there's tremendous ad spend in that category. There's tremendous like brand value when you get down to it. Even if you're a B2B company, you're still thinking about how do you get individual advocates in this component. So, uh, but the commerce element of it is is very interesting. And I, I like that closed loop analogy or the the concept there. Um, th thinking in those terms, I think my follow up on uh, what this means for Adobe is. There, there's money, like there's going to be monetary aspects tied back to, you know, we, we talk about this trouble with attribution, you know, with a lot of the Adobe products, there's a lot of analytics involved, you know, particularly with Omniture and all these other solutions, but now we're talking about money here, and I, I'm curious how they put that in the loop. Magento is an extremely broad, I mean, it's an extremely robust platform, and I, I'd love to see how they transform that experience for people uh, and companies, small to large, about how to make transactions or make e-commerce easy, right? The theoretical thing you would think is now that they have the magenta, well, it's not official, but when it's all totally done, now they have the end. They can put the data mm -hmm. that says, mm -hmm. all right, not only, oh, this, all this great analytics is great, but now we know specifically these are the transactions that got closed to this. We don't have to go outside now mm -hmm. to piece it together. Now we have the actual transaction that we can tie back to all the efforts you did on your marketing and even on your sales, all of that. So the 
having it all together, having all the data now makes it even more powerful mm -hmm. in addition to the, you know, giving the people the, the platform to put it all together. Now the data is going to be able to tell you, oh yeah, this stuff really did work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, let me throw another question to you about the same, uh, you know, same topic here. How do you feel that maybe acquiring something like Magento, this, the other part of the closed loop is keeping the customer data under one roof, right? So if you have to share that data, there is some legal consequences oh, yeah. and maneuvering that's dealt with. If it's all under one platform, that sort of gives a company or uh, an organization leeway to say, look, it's under, you know, we bought Adobe suite of tools or we put this under an Adobe suite. You know, what do you think this might have an impact in terms of navigating that privacy matters or you know we, we could talk about the marketing preferences and getting to know and personalization but what about the privacy aspect does it make it any easier uh, I guess yes and no um, it's got to be um, a fine line that these companies walk because as they require their DMPs and they require right. companies and not only do they have the data now they have the tools to really easily bring it together in real time and analyze it where's the line you know are you i know they have to be it's got to be a bit of a uh, we want to do this but we know we shouldn't because you have all this data you can look at you don't even have to go down to the individual level you can go at the industry level and right. say you know we can make some really cool industry benchmarks oh yeah uh but do our customers want their data involved in those benchmarks because at some point it, it, it could be kind of easy to extrapolate and to a certain extent, you know, big companies drive the the all the, the you know the, whoever has the the more data, and your big companies are going to make up about eighty percent of your data. You're going to start to say, well, these top five companies are involved in this benchmarking. <laughs> That's right. You know, so how much of it can you and should you do, and how much uh, do you allow your customers to tell you? Hey, I don't want me. I don't want to be a part of this. Right. Um, so there are a lot of concerns that I think are going to have to be disclosed. And then you know, then you have, you know, a CEO of Salesforce coming out pretty strong saying, oh you know gosh, what? Yes. We may need government regulation around these data privacy issues, and that adds a complete. Oh, new my. layer of complexity. Well, also. you know, and of course, you know, because we all want to pick on Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook about all of this, <laughs> right? But I mean, there was the latest announcement of, speaking of having all that data with disparate solutions that have been acquired together, the EU mm -hmm. wants to break up Facebook and WhatsApp, you know, as, wow. as potential, yeah. you know, ways to mitigate some of the risk of customer data. So uh, yeah, lots of interesting things coming to come to bear right now. It'll be interesting to hear from you and the MarTech landscape next year <laughs> as all these things begin to play out. Who knows what else? Acquisition, Shopify, I'll, I'll throw this out at you. What if a HubSpot bought Shopify? How, how would that affect things? Makes sense. I, I don't want to, I, there's no need to really divulge it. I mean, it, I mean it, it's, it sounds like a great combination if they ended up doing that. I mean, Shopify has a great, strong community again. Uh, you know, the way they operate, if you've ever been a Shopify customer, they literally are working to help you build your business because they recognize that that would be very beneficial to them. Uh, same MO with uh, HubSpot. I was, uh, you know, we were a partner of HubSpot in the past life and um, actually with Intellify, we are one as well, but for different reasons. And, you know, their partner programs are all about, hey, let's help you be better partners. Let's give you some free stock photos. Let's give you, here's how you do pricing. It's not, here's more capabilities. And Shopify does the same thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, coming back to uh, similar philosophies on how to grow, uh, how to build some resilience with your communities uh, or within, embedded within your communities, I think is, is, is uh, that's an interesting notion. I think uh, somebody's going to have to buy Shopify. <laughs> I mean, literally, if you want to remain a player uh, at the level of some of the companies we talked about, I mean, I don't, I don't, I think Shopify and HubSpot is a really great fit because I think there's a lot of commonality in their customer base, um, in addition to, like you said, some of their philosophies. But it, it may make even more sense to a, a company that's competing with HubSpot to buy Shopify just for that fact. Well, so. does Shopify even want to be bought? Right, I mean, I if, if, again, like back to this, I still see this trend of, you know, I mean, if we're talking about AI, not, you know, taking over jobs, not all jobs, but certainly a lot of the tedious jobs, 
Uh, you know, it's certainly going to a gig economy because we, you know, we people don't work at companies for 30 years. Those baby boomers, right? Gen Xers, we're figuring we're we're in the middle of all that, right? And then. Um, you know, if that's all happening, people are going to be starting their own businesses. They're going to be finding alternate sources of revenue. Shopify yeah. is squarely in a great position. Yeah, they're that, like the last of this, the last right. man standing at this point. Right, right. I mean, I, I guess Amazon Marketplace is close. Like, if you want to sell stuff, and you know, but still, I mean, uh, it's it's going to be interesting to yeah, see. I don't think anybody's going to buy Amazon. Though. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> they've already done their they've already done their part. Uh, all right, this has been great. We could go on all day talking about this <laughs> stuff. Uh, but uh, for the uh, for time's sake, uh, where can people learn more about this year's MarTech landscape and about anything else you're into? Right now? Yeah, well, there will be a post from me on LinkedIn. Uh, so if you're not already following me on LinkedIn, uh, certainly do so or Twitter uh, at On and Talker. Uh, and then, of course, on LinkedIn, you can just use my name. Uh, I will also, uh, I'm still cleaning up my own personal website, so onandtalker.com if you dare. Um, <laughs> just be kind to me as you subscribe. Uh, but that we'll be talking about, uh, I will have my own take on there. Of course, Chief Martech, uh, there's a post on, you know, what's the, certainly about the conference itself, some of the follow-ups, uh, what's coming up in October. Uh, and I think the, just to kind of give everyone an opportunity to, you know, just get a preview. I mean, Scott and I are trying to, we're, we're pushing to see how we can make the landscape more uh, marketing uh, professional friendly. Like, what, what can we do to help everybody? Because that's the whole point of that landscape. Uh, you know, it, it, the number, it doesn't really matter so much anymore. It's really to give uh, a people